Greetings, folks, and welcome back to our discussion of the House of the Wolfings. What I'd like to do with this little talk is just get into the world of the book a bit, as last time I was speaking more about the world of the author. With that in mind, what I think I'd like to do is give you a bit of the relevant history of the Romans and the Goths, the actual historical setting of the book, and then get into what Morris is doing with those two peoples as a whole. Some talk of some of the main characters also might be a good idea, particularly Theodolf, the Hall son, and the Wood son. If there's time at the end, I'll say a bit about the respective religions of the Goths and the Romans. Otherwise, I'll save that for the third talk. Maybe we'll start with a little bit of history. The book is set during the period of the late Roman Empire, and Morris is kind of cagey about the time. He never pins it down exactly. We know it's late because it was during the late imperial period that the Romans made serious encounters with the Germanic peoples. Tacitus wrote Germania, for example, in the first century, and the Roman encounters with the Germanic peoples, particularly the Goths, continued until the sacking of Rome by the Goths in 476. But that's just the Roman perspective. From the Gothic point of view, the novel is set early in the Germanic migration period. The migration period, broadly speaking, spans about the 1st to the 5th centuries. And given that it's clear that the Romans in this novel are not Christian yet, the latest possible date would be 310 AD. So I tend to see the book as likely being set in the perhaps 2nd or 3rd century. And that's about as specific as I can really get. There certainly is an awareness of the Huns as a threat looming off to the east, which is historically accurate. It was as a result of fleeing the Huns that the Germanic peoples made their way westward. And their encounter with the Huns figures largely in their own historical and mythological lore. With Attila, for example, having the name Atli in the Norse tradition and Edsel in the High German tradition, in which guises he appears in the Volsunga Saga and the Nibelungenlied, respectively, as well as in a number of other sources. As with the period, the actual setting of the novel is also kind of nebulous. It's in Europe, near the Roman frontier. I'm thinking it's probably towards the eastern end of the Alps because of internal references to the Burgundians, but that's just my guess. Morris uses the historical names of known tribes, but again, the references are nebulous and difficult to pin down. One tribe he particularly likes to refer to is the Shieldings, which as someone who studied Beowulf makes me very happy. Because, of course, the Shielding dynasty is the dynasty of the Danes, the dynasty of Hrothgar. And Morris is certainly working with that literary knowledge. In fact, he brings so many different peoples together just by vague references. And not just, not just Germanic peoples, but Celts as well. He refers to the Cymri, which is the name that the Welsh call themselves, as having been a people with whom the Goths at one point were allied against Rome. Now, to the best of my knowledge, the only people to call themselves the Cymri, which means companions or comrades, are the Welsh of the British Isles, the original Britons. So with Morris using that name for what probably are the Gauls, actually, it looks like he's crafting, in a sense, a sort of collective British identity, or as I said in the last talk, a collective Northern European identity, at least. I should also say something, as long as I'm mentioning the Welsh, about his use of the word Welshman and the word Welsh. Because Morris has the Goths refer to the Romans as Welsh. There's a reason for that. And the reason is that the word Welsh, coming from Old English Welas, means foreigner. And the term Wales is an English designation meaning basically the country of the foreigners. The Welsh were designated foreigners. This is why, of course, they don't call themselves the Welsh. They call themselves the Cymri, the comrades, the companions. So from the Goths' point of view, the Romans are simply foreigners, and that's what that term Welsh designates. 
As for the actual location of most of the narrative, it's set in a place called The Mark and in a forest called Merk Wood. And yes, this is where Tolkien got the name Merk Wood. Tolkien owes a lot to Morris, actually. And perhaps that's something we can discuss during one of the tutorials. For Morris, of course, though, Mirkwood is not a dark and dangerous place, but rather simply the place where the Goths have lived for at least several generations. We're not exactly sure, but long enough at least for the river to change names a few times. The part of Mirkwood that they're set in also appears to be in the foothills of the Alps. Again, exactly where along the Alps, we're not exactly sure. But in any case, as I've already mentioned, along the frontier of Roman territory. Close enough that they're familiar with other Gothic tribes that have become what were called client states or client nations to the Romans, who had allied themselves with the Romans either through intimidation or bribery or simply trying to play various powers against each other. And the reasons for that decision, of course, varied from tribe to tribe or nation to nation. But with the fuzzy timeline and the fuzzy setting. Once again, I think the idea is put forward that Morris is trying to craft a broad or general Northern European identity against the Mediterranean identity embodied by the Romans. And that has defined for a couple of thousand years, the mainstream of European culture. That is, he's appealing broadly speaking to the what we might call the native traditions or indigenous traditions of Northern European peoples. In terms of the book's style, this is probably the element that will give most readers the most difficulty. This is not an easy book to read. I've been reading this book for many years. I think I bought my first copy in, oh, I don't know, the late 80s. And even by the standards of William Morris's prose, and all of that's archaic. This one's a little weird. In his writing, he consistently prefers older structures or older forms. That is, he's using a self-consciously antiquarian diction and self-consciously antiquarian syntax. Similarly, he opts for a dominantly Germanic vocabulary and in a language in which only about 1% of the total lexicon comes from Old English this is necessarily going to mean cutting out quite a few options. Of course, his options aren't just drawn from Old English. He also draws on other Germanic languages, but mostly, of course, he draws on Old English words because he's writing in English. But between these two things, the older structures and forms and the strong preference for Germanic vocabulary, what he seems to be doing is not so much just being showy and archaic, but trying to distill the essence of a cultural identity out of all of the other elements that are floating around in the culture in which he lives. And in that sense, I think, if we read what he's doing as an act of distillation, or if you prefer maybe an act of winnowing, then in finding the diction and style to be a little alienating, what we want to do maybe, or I think what Morris might want us to do, is turn around and look at ourselves and ask, well, what is it in you that is making these particular elements seem foreign to you? And by we, by the way, what I mean is Morris's original British readers. Of course, a non-British reader is going to have a very different take on this. But as I mentioned in the last talk, that effort to construct an organic cultural identity distinct from the influences of mainstream European culture was very much in the air at the time that Morris is working. And not just among artists, but also among politicians and scholars, sometimes with quite lovely results and sometimes with very devastating results. The other element of style that's most likely to stand out to any reader is that it consists of a mix of prose and poetry. This, of course, is uncommon in the novel, but quite frankly, I don't think we're reading a novel. Some of you may recall that I said something like this with Wuthering Heights, and I say the same thing again and with similar reason. Whereas Wuthering Heights, I think, is a myth dressed up as a novel, 
House of the Wolfings appears to be a saga dressed up as a novel, because that style of alternating prose and poetry is typical of the Norse sagas. A body of literature with which Morris was familiar, as I mentioned in the last talk, he translated Volsunga Saga, which is composed in the same style. And an obvious question to ask then is, why? Why is Morris giving us a saga in the guise of a novel? And here, the question also turns around cultural identity. The Norse sagas, or the Icelandic sagas, sorry, are one of the great bodies of literature coming out of the medieval world. They all at least put themselves forward as preserving the lore of vanished days, be it mythological lore with the Fornaldarsogar, the sagas of the elder days, or the early history of Iceland itself with the Islendingasogar, the sagas of Icelanders, also known as historical sagas. So by adopting that particular art form, or that particular genre, Morris is once again placing himself solidly in the world of Northern Europe, in the cultural sphere of Northern Europe. It's also worth noting that where the poetry is concerned, all of it is direct speech by characters. There's no poetry given by the narrator. The narrator speaks in prose only. It's the characters within the narration who speak in poetry. And there's something going on here as well that I think we need to consider in terms specifically of Morris's antiquarianism. Generally speaking in the sagas, and this is also true incidentally in the Irish epic Toin Behulinga, which is composed in the same style, probably under the influence of, of, of Norse storytellers. The poetic bits are generally understood or represented as being the older bits. So even within the text, which itself is antiquarian, when characters speak in poetry, this is a harking back to a time when the culture itself preserved itself in poetry for the very simple reason that the Germanic peoples, until they came into contact with specifically Christian monks, were not literate. They had an oral culture. They passed things down through word of mouth in poetry. That's what poetry does, or that's what their poetry did. It was a way of preserving their culture. So when the characters break into poetry here, I think we're not to understand that even within the world of the novel, they really were speaking in poetry, but that the novel itself is presenting a recollection of an older time that itself is preserved in the snippets of poetry that the narrator is including in the text. So there's this double distancing of time and culture through both years and through media of transmission. And that's all I really want to say about the style of the book for now. So next, I think we should maybe take a look at a few characters, specifically Theodolf, the Hall son, and the Wood son. The main character, of course, is Theodolf, whose name means wolf of the people, and he is the leader of the Wolfings. As for what the name Wolfings means, wolf is obvious. Ing is an English patronymic, very much as Mac in Gaelic or Vich in Russian. So just as MacDonald means son of Donald or Alexeyevich means son of Alexei, Wolfings means son of the wolf, or if you prefer as a plural, children of the wolf. So as far as names go, and I think I might want to say a bit more about names later, all of the tribes of the Goths that we encounter, they're something or other ings. They take as their nominal totem, I guess, their nominal origin, a particular animal, or in the case of the beamings, a tree. But as for Theodolf himself, He's a leader by virtue of merit. That is, it's mentioned over and over in the text that he has both the capacity and the character of a good leader. He leads by example, not by order, from the front, not from behind, and is on very good terms, and on very genuinely affectionate terms with the people over whom he has authority. And here I think it's worth mentioning Something that I've always found interesting in, in ruler words, words for particularly the person in charge 
of a large body of people. In English, if you want to go back through the Germanic heritage, that word is king. The Latin word for king is rex. Well, okay, let's talk about that for a second because, of course, we're going to get to the Romans in a bit. Rex comes from rex, we would spell R-E-G-S, and it means ruler. So the one who rules over. King, the old English word for king is kuning. Kun is where we get our word kin, and ing means son of or child of. So whereas in Latin, the rex is the ruler over the people, in English, the king is a child of the kin or a scion of the people. The word itself carries an organic connection of ruler and ruled, whereas the Roman word does not. But getting back to Theodolf himself, he is the father of the Hall son, and I'll say more about that in a moment. He also is not from here. He is from away. He is a dark-haired person among a community of mostly blonde-haired people, and Morris makes clear that the darker-haired people in this community tend to have foreign blood. This is a common Indo-European heroic motif, going right back through the whole history of epic literature, which is my favorite genre, and I could talk about it all day if you let me. There's something about the hero in Indo-European heroic narrative that is other, that is from away. Beowulf, for example, when he's fighting Grendel and Grendel's mother, he, of course, is a foreigner himself. But even among his own people, the Yates, his father is a foreigner. Achilles is raised on the outskirts of the Greek world. And I could go on. There is something in the heroic identity, in the epic heroic identity, that is other relative to the people for whom the hero fights, and Theodolf partakes of that tradition. As for the Hall son, she is the daughter of Theodolf and the Wood son, to whom we'll get next. She is dark-haired like Theodolf, whom she doesn't know to be her father at the beginning, but simply views as her foster father. She's also a keeper of the lamp by the same name, a lamp that is perpetually lit and over which she has authority or with the keeping of which she's been charged, in a traditional post handed down woman to woman to woman. We're told that the Hall son must be of the wolfing kindred, which means that she can't marry, because the Goths, at least in Morris's depiction, practice something called exogamy. They don't marry from their own clan. So any married woman in the Hall would be a woman of another house. What I find particularly interesting with the Hall son, though, is that her name is her function. That is, her identity arises from what she does. This is explicit in her name, but I think this is simply a making explicit of something that Morris is doing with all of his Gothic characters. That is, your identity arises from what you do. These are people who value action. They live in a concrete world of forest and farm and fish and fighting foreigners. Wasn't planning on that long run of alliteration, but it works for me, so I'm going to keep it. I'm also going to keep the notion of identity arising from action. I think this is quite lovely, actually, and it is, it's a version or a vision of identity to which I personally subscribe just to lay all my cards on the table. Regardless of what we think, regardless of what we say, who we are ultimately emerges from what we do. And more importantly, or at least as importantly, what we do is always done in the context of our community. That is, for the Goths, for Morris, and I think this is generally true, in the absence of community, you aren't anybody. Oh, and also she, of course, has the gift of foresight, something she inherits from her mother, to whom we'll go next. As for the wood son, what do we say? Well, she's a Valkyrie, a lesser goddess, who in this case happens to be associated with the forest, and who happens to love Theodolf. This, of course, says a lot about Theodolf, because goddesses don't love just anyone. That is, it's a statement of his worthiness that she would be interested in him. But it also says something about the divine that she is interested in him. That is and I'll get to this in a bit, the Goths live very close to the divine. They're not alienated from it, whereas the Romans actually are. 
So the understandings of the relationship with the divine among the Goths and among the Romans, among the pagan Europeans, and among the invading worldviews from the Mediterranean are quite different. But I'm going to pause on that for now and talk a bit more about names. Because, of course, the names Woodson and Hallson reflect each other, don't they? So there's also this sense, in terms of her maternal inheritance with the Woodson, that she brings something of the forest. She brings something of her mother's divine nature to the hall. This is reflected in her name, of course, and in her foresight. And it indicates, in a pretty concrete way, the closeness with which the Goths live to the land. And, as I said a moment ago, the closeness with which they live to the divine. It is, of course, the wood son who falls in love with Theodolf and therefore gives him a dwarf-made hauberk, a male shirt, whose function is to protect him from harm. Now, the dwarfs in, in Norse mythology are particularly dangerous not because they're evil, but because they're devious. They are subterranean both physically and psychologically. And while they always live up to their oaths, they're very legalistic. They're extremely dangerous when crossed, and their words don't always mean exactly what you might think they mean. But to return to the Woodson, I should probably ask you what you think it means that a goddess would fall in love with a human. What does that say about human worth in Morris's conception? Because there's a great deal in this book about innate human worth and the recognition of it and the failure to recognize it and the outright denial of it. And much of that discourse is bound up in conceptions and relationships with the divine. And now, as I've reached slide eight in what at the moment looks like a 16 slide presentation, what I think I'm going to do is edit this chunk and post it for you folks, and then move on to record part two, hopefully get that done before too terribly long. So thanks for listening so far. I'll be back shortly. Bye for now. Now, I think it's time we take a few minutes to talk about the Goths themselves, or rather at least Morris's Goths, and maybe take a minute as well to discuss where Morris's Goths intersect with the historic Germanic peoples. Well, to start, as I've already mentioned, Morris does use the Goths as a sort of a metaphor for socialism. He does this, and I think can do this fairly legitimately, because their social structure is relatively egalitarian compared to that of the Romans, and certainly also compared to that of the British of the Victorian period. The economic distance between the highest and the lowest tiers in society is relatively modest. As I already mentioned, with the people on the top tier also still working the fields. This egalitarianism also applies to decision-making. When the Goths need to make a collective decision, they don't simply await the word of the ruler, but they gather at a thing called a thing, that is, a parliament, effectively, in which all citizens are given the chance to speak, and decision is made by consensus. Now, interestingly, and perhaps unsurprisingly, both the institution and the word are well attested in history. Tacitus, going back to the first century with, as I said, the oldest surviving substantial report on the Germanic peoples, describes this as the way they make their decisions. And right down to late Norse pagan antiquity, if you want to call it that, the thing remained a vital part of society. In pre-conversion Iceland, for example, and for historical reference, Iceland converted to Christianity in 1000 AD, so, com so comparatively late. There were both quarterly things and annual all things, and these were the parliaments at which the major decisions were made that affected the community at large and the country as a whole. These were where legal cases were tried and judgments passed and 
fines paid and that kind of thing. In fact, it's worth noting that the things of both Iceland and the Faroe Islands, each established in the year 935, are the oldest continually functioning parliaments in the world at the moment, and both of them were founded two generations or more before the conversion to Christianity, and the only three things that either of them owe to either Christian or Roman culture are sweet, fuck, and all. That is, parliamentary government is a Germanic tradition that has nothing to do with any of the cultures of the Mediterranean. Now, when Tacitus draws attention to this institution in the first century, he's holding it up in stark contrast to the imperial government of Rome, the top-down authoritarian way in which Romans were at that time making their political decisions. And incidentally, it is the bureaucracy of the Roman Empire that still serves in the Roman Church, that is, in the Vatican. There's a direct line between the imperial government of Rome and the government of the Western Church, both of which are top-down authoritarian structures. Similarly, Morris is on very solid ground when he describes the election of war dukes, and not just one but two, to command a unified force for the duration of hostilities, but whose authority does not extend beyond those hostilities. That is, once again, turning to Tacitus in the first century. Germanic society, and here we're looking almost precisely at the time period in which Morris is setting his work, consisted of independent and autonomous communities who functioned or could function as a coherent unit temporarily under the authority of elected commanders whose authority was limited to military command and did not extend beyond military operations. Of course, we don't want to be too rosy about the Goths. They did keep people whom they refer to as thralls, and I think we need to distinguish here between thralls and slaves. I'll do that more explicitly when we get to the Roman practice of slavery. In the meantime, it's worth noting that the Goths' thralls are members of conquered outgroups, and that the thralls, while not granted full membership in the house, that is, not being granted something that we would call citizenship, are described or portrayed as being well-treated to the point where they're armed and willingly fight in defense of the Goths themselves, and are often adopted into the various houses. Now, this itself is also interesting. It points to an openness in Gothic culture, as Morrison describes it, which, which seems to be historically accurate. When we refer to the Germanic peoples, we're not actually referring to a racial group. We're referring to a language and cultural group. That border is very fuzzy where race is concerned. And while it was popular, particularly in the 19th and early 20th century, to view the various members of the Indo-European language and culture family in racial terms, I think Morris is at least partly on the page of recognizing that this is primarily a cultural, not a genetic group. That is an open group, membership in which you can be born to, but you can also earn. Gothic thraldom as well is, while based upon outgroups, not racial, that is, there is no particular group that are defined as the group from which we draw our slaves. And incidentally, by the way, the place where the Slavs got their name was from the Roman word for slave. Also notable in the Gothic approach to thraldom is that this is not chattel slavery. They don't trade in thralls the way the Romans or the way that numerous modern peoples have traded in slaves. That is, there is no way in this culture, as Morris describes it, in which a human being can become property. Now, this is a little idealistic, I think. We do know certainly that one of the objects of the Viking raids, for example, was to collect people to be sold on slave markets. So I just want to make sure that at least 
I'm not giving too rosy a picture of Germanic culture as we go through this little talk. To move on to general living styles, though, here as well, Morris is at least not too far off. The center of life in Germanic culture was traditionally the hall. And while not everyone lived there, or rather not everyone slept there, many did, and it was the communal gathering place, or at least the indoor communal gathering place. This is exactly reflected in the centrality of the hall itself, the house of the Wolfings as a physical object rather than the family group. And, of course, it's interesting that the title of the novel does double duty there, doesn't it? Because the book is both about the house in the kindred sense and the house in the structural sense. There is a way in which these two things are actually inseparable. The house as a structure physically embodies the house as a kinship group. And if you're wondering about how important this is, Think about the name of Odin's hall in Norse mythology, Valhalla. That hala element is hall. The val element, by the way, is slaughter. So there are a couple of ways you could read Valhalla. You can read it as hall of the slain, because of course this is where the warriors who die bravely in battle get to go. But you can also call it slaughter hall. I like that one better because it's messier but I have a hunch that the first one is the one that's actually intended. In any case, the hall is not just politically and familially, but also mythically central to the culture of the Germanic peoples or the cultures of the Germanic peoples. You see the same thing in Beowulf, don't you? And I'm assuming by this point most of you have read Beowulf. If you haven't, you darn well should. Morris's Goths and the historic Germanic and the historical Germanic peoples are also largely defined by strong kinship bonds. Family is everything or damned near. The only thing that's more important than family is, of course, your given word. And family also is quite broadly understood. In Morris's case, the family is the house, and all members of the house see each other as siblings. And one's personal identity, in fact, one's very human worth, is defined by the relationship to the house and more broadly by the relationship to the kindred. That is, this is not an individualistic society in the sense of the very insular notions of selfhood that have emerged since the Enlightenment. And here I have to admit just right off the top that I'm on Morris's page with this one 100% and that I see Enlightenment notions of selfhood based upon pure autonomy and, and individuality to be, at best, a perversion or truncation of the complete human person. In that sense, the kind of naked self-interest and narrow self-interest that defines capitalist thought and capitalist economics simply has no place in a kinship-based society such as that practiced by Morris's Goths and those practiced by tribal societies typically around the world historically. And not just by tribal societies, but also by many of the other societies that the Christian West was at that point in the process of encountering and destroying, or at least attempting to destroy. And as long as we're on the topic of differences between Gothic society and the Christian West, we need to speak about the roles and relationships involving women. Here again, we go back to Tacitus. Roman society, and Greek society as well, were extremely patriarchal. The roles of women were very circumscribed, confined effectively by the walls of the home. The same is true of women in both Old and New Testaments, at least according to certain readings and certain readings that have been historically influential, such as, for example, and I'm not even going to bother with the Old Testament, Paul's admonition that a woman should be silent in church and that you should not suffer a woman to teach or to exert authority over a man. And while these can be spun in such a way as to make it look like they say something other than what they actually say, that kind of 
text fuckery is exactly what the field of apologetics is. Now, I'm not going to pretend that traditional Germanic society was one based upon equality among genders, but to make good on my reference to Tacitus, once again holding his own society in contrast with the society of the people he was observing, he noted that women typically do play important roles in Germanic culture and are generally accredited with having particular insight, especially where dreams are concerned, and that one ignores the advice of a woman at one's peril. That is, the notion of the wise woman was alive and well in pre-conversion Germanic culture. After the conversion, of course, those women were simply referred to as witches and were burned in very large numbers. And historically speaking, the conversion did not do women any favors. We're actually learning more and more about that even in recent years with the discovery of burials, pre-conversion burials of women associated with weapons of war, that is women being out in the world under arms, or even in at least one case that I came across a while ago, the realization that a grave that had long been thought to, to have belonged to a man actually belonged to a woman, and this also is a grave associated with weapons of war. That is, the Germanic world is a world in which, though I won't pretend that the genders were equal, the strictly enforced binary roles of both Roman and traditional Christian society had no place. Another detail about Morris's Goths that also corresponds to the lives of pre-conversion Germanic societies is that they were not literate. They passed down their culture, be it history, legend, myth, what have you, by word of mouth. That is, theirs was an oral tradition, not a written tradition. And it's the orality of this tradition that stands behind the poetic passages in the text itself, as I've already mentioned. That is, once again, these passages are intended to reflect the oldest elements of the story that Morris is putting forward within the world of the novel itself. And for all that a written tradition is demonstrably superior to an oral tradition in a number of ways, including accuracy and preservation, there are ways in which an oral tradition, a tradition that is only embodied in the minds and mouths of its members, can connect, I think, in a meaningful, organic, and non-abstract way to its culture that a written tradition actually can't do. Also worth noting on the Goths, before we move on to the Romans, is that these are people who respect hospitality. When someone comes to their door, they are welcomed and given food, given drink, made to feel at home, before they're even required to say who they are or what their errand is. This is consistent with the hospitality tradition of the peoples whom Morris is sort of conflating into his Goths, it's also incidentally true of the Greeks of the Heroic Age, but is most emphatically not true of Morris's Romans, or I believe of the historical Romans, during the Imperial period. Now, when it comes to the Romans, just as the Goths are emblematic of socialism, as Morris understands it, the Romans are sort of his personification of both capitalism and imperialism. Even their password, no limit, is very revealing, isn't it? Because, of course, it does embody very concisely the notion that there is no limit to, say, economic growth or acquisition, that the world is there for the taking if you can take it, and that its worth, its value, arises merely out of what you can wrest from it for your own benefit. So, whereas the Goths exist in a very symbiotic relationship with the natural world, the Romans don't. The Romans simply take. They conquer and they take. And their cities are described as, for example, wealthy but very unhappy places. That is, there's also this notion that this unrestrained acquisitiveness of both imperialism and capitalism while perhaps successful, is also not good for the majority of people. It makes them, in Morris's words, 
rich but unhappy. And I think that's a good description of much of modernity, not all of it, but much of it, certainly. And certainly it, I think, would ring true to the hollowness of the culture of consumerism that was in its early flourishing in the Victorian period and whose fruits, and I use the word fruits in quotation marks, were witnessing now in terms of both social alienation and environmental degradation. It's worth noting as well that this is a very hierarchical society. Those who have are in charge. Those who don't aren't. And those who have tend to be those who are strong. And by strong is meant simply capable of inflicting suffering on others. That is brutal. Discipline, for example, in the Roman legions involves beating and often a process called decimation. Decimation, just in case you're not clear on the term, is something that was carried out on a legion that had performed particularly poorly. And the process worked something like this. Every tenth man was singled out to be killed. And he was to be killed by his fellow legionnaires who, if they did not participate in the killing, were killed themselves. So here as well, we see a difference in the sense of worth between the Romans and the Goths. That your worth in the Roman system, and incidentally also in the imperialist and capitalist system, is exclusively based on how you serve the power structure, how well you fulfill a particular function, as if you were a part in a machine. Now, the Romans were very good at military organization. The legions were effectively military machines, and they were very well-designed ones. And there's much in modern military theory that has its origin in Roman military theory. But one thing that is notably absent in the Roman social structure, that is notably present in the Gothic social structure, is that sense of an innate worth of the human person. The axis of relationship, then, is power, or if you want to pause it to, power and wealth, as measured by narrow economic interest, really, as opposed to the Gothic social structure, which as a communitarian structure is predicated on mutual nurturing and sacrifice for the whole, but not a sacrifice that is demanded or met with brutality if it isn't given but a sacrifice that arises from within one's own character. And I think it's maybe worth noting here that Morris's Goths tend, far more than his Romans, to be people of character. And that as well, there is something about both imperialism and unrestrained capitalism that is profoundly destructive of character. So, despite their obvious power, the Romans are very conspicuously not free themselves. They're not free because they can't be free in a top-down social organization such as the one in which they live, particularly one with such a broad gap between the lowest and the highest tiers so that there is no moral connection, for example, between, we'll say, the legionnaires and the emperor because they don't have to do with each other, because they don't share in a common endeavor, in a common set of tasks, they occupy different worlds, both materially and morally, and the legionnaires are effectively just implements, not only to their emperor, but also apparently to their commanders, who beat them and execute them quite ruthlessly. And as long, of course, as we're on the topic of freedom, we also need to discuss slavery. Unlike the Goths, the Romans in Morris's novel and the Romans in history do practice and did practice chattel slavery. And here we need to distinguish between Roman slaves and Gothic thralls. The thralls, as I said, are associated with particular houses and often do gain admittance to those houses. They are also not beaten, not raped, and not sold, all of which happens regularly and did happen regularly with Roman slaves. It's also worth noting in the world of the novel that 
while the thralls tend to be specifically defeated martial opponents, the Romans will enslave an entire population. As I said, it's from the Roman slave trade that the Slavs get their name. That is, there is no sense of dignity, there is no sense of worth where a defeated opponent or a defeated people are concerned. And this makes sense, doesn't it? If Morris's Romans are the vehicle through which he is exploring both imperialism and capitalism. Because, of course, the capitalist outlook on anything and anyone is that they are an implement. Similarly, the Romans in Morris's depiction have no symbiotic relationship with the land, such as the Goths do, and he also portrays them as having very weak kinship bonds. This tends to make sense as well, doesn't it? Because, of course, the Romans are an urban culture, and urban culture by its very nature does undermine kinship bonds. A number of rapidly urbanizing 20th century and 21st century cultures can attest to this fact, and I can remember witnessing it when I was living in Korea in a farming village and noticing the difference and hearing people discuss the difference between the more traditional life in the village in which I lived and the life and the lives of people in the cities that I very much enjoyed visiting. And I have to say this without any hint of passing judgment on people in the cities or people in the country. I've lived in the same building for six years right now, and I have no idea who my neighbors are. I am pretty sure I've been here longer than any of them. This also is part of urban culture, isn't it? That it tends to be more transient. And this also speaks to the reduced sense of place, the reduced sense of organic connection to place. I suppose we might say that cities are not really places at all. They're things. They have locations, but they're not places. Not in the sense that Morris's Mark and Merck Wood are places with which the people who live there have, I keep using the word organic, but it's quite apt, and also deeply spiritual relationships. Relationships rooted in generations of history arising from the same soil. And now I think, though, I do actually have two slides slating a discussion of the respective religions of the Goths and the Romans. I'm going to save that for the next lecture and probably get into it in a little more depth there than I was planning on getting into it here. So, this pretty much wraps up part two of lecture two on the House of the Wolfings. I, I do hope you're enjoying this, the book especially, but also the lectures. There will be a couple more coming this week. And, of course, we'll be wrapping the book up on Friday, so do try to have it finished by then. After which, we'll be jumping into our final book of the year, H.G. Wells' wonderful science fiction novel, The Time Machine, rounding out our discussion of both late Victorian socialism and late Victorian speculative fiction. For now, though, of course, thank you very much for listening. Bye for now.